thank you for coming in spite of the storm. This is like eight times as many people as like, I literally expected it to be like me and Alex and Ilya and like one or two other people. So this is really exciting and high internet. <laughs> um, cool. So I'm Lane and uh, I am here to talk to you guys about a couple things. The first of those things is Space Mesh. Uh, and the second is um, WASM, WebAssembly Technology, uh, Smart Contracts, WebAssembly-based virtual machines um, in the context of Space Mesh, but broadly, more broadly as well. Um, so let's see if this works. Cool. So I um, worked primarily on Ethereum for about 18 months as a member of the eWASM team. Uh, so that's a team that's focused on, as the name suggests, building the next generation um, smart contract virtual machine for Ethereum. Uh, shout out to you awesome people. Alex, thanks for coming. <laughs> um, so we'll talk a little bit about, uh, about that. Um, and then a few months ago, I changed gears and I've been focusing primarily on, uh, yeah, on a new project called Space Mesh. So I'll start by introducing Space Mesh a little bit. So I'm curious, how many of you have heard of Space Mesh before? Show of hands. Okay, actually most people, cool. And how many people know, let's see, what is the consensus mechanism used by Space Mesh? Okay, cool. So people have heard of the project, but don't know a ton about it. So that's awesome. Um, yeah, that's what we'll talk about first. So uh, the f yeah, the very, very first thing I want to talk about is motivation. So this is um, both motivation for the Space Mesh, the project, as well as kind of my personal motivation for working on it, why I think it's so cool. <laughs> So um, I think everyone in this room knows what proof of work is. You know, it's kind of um, uh, as as Vitalik said in his in his keynote, not the first. Sorry, I think I was using my thumb. Not the first solution to the Byzantine generals problem, um, but it was sort of the first permissionless uh, solution to that problem. Um, Satoshi Nakamoto, Bitcoin, etc. I won't spend too much time talking about that. So this is kind of his magic trick for figuring out how we can have um, a very, very large number of parties um, relative to what sort of the previous family or generation of consensus algorithms supported. Um, a very large um, group of parties who don't know each other ahead of time um, and aren't necessarily permissioned to nevertheless achieve consensus and kind of solve this Byzantine generals problem. Uh, so yeah, so proof of work is kind of cool, right? It's, um, it's very elegant. That's one thing I like about it. There's some really, really nice uh, mathematical properties to it, uh, such as the fact that someone, you know, just receiving a, someone who kind of looks at like the Bitcoin blockchain or the Ethereum blockchain um, and hasn't been following, you know, from Genesis can immediately validate that the proof of work contained in the block headers all the way back to the first block is valid, right, relatively quickly. And that's, that's much harder to do with things like proof of stake. Um, however, again, I'm preaching to the choir here. As everyone knows, it's energy inefficient. It kills seals and trees and things like that. Um, you know, I, I, I want to emphasize, like, this is a really interesting debate, and there's sort of multiple sides to this, right? And so there are, you know, relatively critical articles that come out and say, oh, my God, Bitcoin proof of work mining is as big as Ireland or as big as, you know, Austria or whatever country it is right now. And then, you know, um, Andreas Antonopoulos will respond and say, Bitcoin mining is not wasteful. What's wasteful is Christmas tree lights, you know, which uses way more energy than Bitcoin. So you kind of have to look at both sides of the equation and look at like what that energy is paying for. And of course, I think all of us do believe that there's value in kind of a, you know, a global um, consensus driven state machine like Bitcoin or Ethereum. Um, but there's, there's other issues with it as well. And, and certainly other things being equal, we'd like to kill less trees. I think probably everyone here would agree with that. That's one motivation for things like proof of stake. Um, so interesting point about it. Does this work, right? Is that, oh, green laser pointer. Whoa, what can, <laughs> Japan technology, whoa. Um, so, so proof of work mining, at least in Bitcoin, and I think this applies to Ethereum as well, is actually not strictly incentive compatible. Um, and, and what that means is, so what incentive compatibility refers to, it's kind of a, you know, big word that distributed um, systems you know, researchers use, it, it really is a very simple idea. It just means that everyone is incentivized to follow the rules of the protocol at all times, right? There's, you can't gain anything by cheating, at least not inside the protocol. There's always 
extra protocol incentives. You know, if I'm some irrational actor who's just in it for the lulls, or if I, you know, place a massive short on Bitcoin or Ether in the market, and then I want to like destroy the network or something, right? We, we can't really prevent um, perverse incentives outside the protocol. But at least as far as the protocol is concerned, an incentive compatible protocol means that, as I said, every rational actor is incentivized to always follow the rules of the protocol and they will benefit, they will maximize their own benefit by doing so. And it's been proven by multiple researchers that, uh, again, the papers I've read are uh, with respect to Bitcoin. Um, I think it applies to Ethereum as well. But there are certain scenarios such as selfish mining where miners are actually incentivized not to follow the rules of the protocol and to do things like withholding blocks from the network. Um, and they can actually increase their own rewards if they do so. Um, so I think that's like a pretty objective argument um, or, or, you know, it, it's, 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 uh, it's a flaw, maybe not a huge flaw, right? Bitcoin works, Ethereum works with proof of work, but it's a small flaw with proof of work. Um, and again, I think we are all familiar with the centralization of mining in Bitcoin and Ethereum. Um, a very, very small number of organizations, a very small number of mining pools control the vast majority of the hash power in, in both of those networks. Uh, something on the order of uh, four, I think, for Bitcoin control, um, I don't know, I'm, I'm sort of making up numbers here, but it's something on the order of like 60% or 70% of hash power. In Ethereum, it's like five that control that amount of hash power. And I think like nine or 10 control 99% of hash power. Um, and so this falls out of the economies of scale that proof of work mining leads to. Uh, and it's not just the centralization, it's also these second order effects like the um, debate around ProgPow in the Ethereum community, right? So ProgPow refers to programmatic proof of work, and it is a new proof of work um, algorithm that's been proposed to replace ETHash, the current one in Ethereum. And the idea is it is, in, in scare quotes, it is ASIC resistant, uh, which what that really means is that it's um, optimized for GPUs, for run of the mill GPUs. Um, and that too. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and it's contentious for a whole bunch of reasons. It raises questions about, you know, is, is Ethereum mining supposed to be, you know, ASIC resistant? And, and, you know, that's not really been explicitly agreed upon by the community. So I don't want to go too deep in that. But the point is, um, it's, um, yeah, I mean, centralization of mining is a pain in the butt, I think, for everybody. Uh, I mentioned selfish mining before, right? So there's sort of ways you can kind of sort of cheat uh, the system. Um, to uh, increase your own rewards. You know, if you operate a very large mining pool or mining operation, then um, the, and you produce a new block, right? You solve the kind of cryptographic puzzle, you produce the next block, um, you have a head start uh, over everyone else in the network because it takes time for that block to propagate through the network and for miners to receive it and begin mining on it. And um, the larger you are, the more blocks you're producing, the more of an um, advantage you have here. Um, Vitalik has a really great article that explains all the math behind this. I, I think it's the one called towards a 12 second block time or something, uh, but really, really fascinating math. Um, so what a lot of projects have done, um, you know, is to choose this alternative called proof of stake, which again, I think many of you are familiar with in the context of Ethereum, um, Casper, of course, near protocol, um, Polkadot, many other projects. Um, it has some very nice properties, right? It's certainly very energy efficient. Um, I'll, I'll let I'll let Ilya tell you all the amazing things about proof of stake when he comes up here, and I, I don't um, don't want to suggest that like it's terrible or that it won't work. Um, but so this is my personal opinion, right? I, I I have I struggle sometimes to get excited about proof of stake for a few reasons. So the first reason is that it's not strictly permissionless, right? Now I'm willing to admit that in practice. A token like Ether is highly liquid, and it's very likely that anyone who kind of wants to, to participate um, in proof of stake mining can go out to a marketplace somewhere and buy some Ether and stake it. And, um, you know, I, I don't know what the latest numbers are. I've heard 32 ETH, right? What does that work out to? It's a few thousand US dollars. Um, you know, it's, it's um, you know, probably work for most people, but in the strictest definition, the strictest sense of the word, it's not permissionless the way that proof of work is, right? The, the, the cool thing about proof of work, one of the very elegant properties is that I can turn on my hardware and start mining. That's it, right? No one needs to sell me anything. No one needs to make room for me. Um, in proof of stake, it's not quite that simple, right? So I have to acquire that stake somewhere. And so again, in the strictest sense, someone has to sell it to me. Um, to the extent that there's a lot of validators that are already validating, uh, depends on the protocol, but I may need someone to kind of like make room for me and you know, create a validation slot for me. Um, 
And, and in particular, the on-ramps are just a pain in the butt, right? Like going out into a market and buying a token like Ether um, may seem relatively straightforward to all of us. We've been doing it for a long time. We probably have accounts with Coinbase or you know, other, other exchanges. Um, but my vision for blockchain is bigger than that and bigger than us. And I think if you're a 12-year-old, a 15-year-old, or, or a person of any age you know, who doesn't have a bank account, doesn't have a credit card, doesn't have easy access to an exchange, um, you're going to maybe struggle to, to go out and kind of buy those tokens and, and, and you know, submit your first transactions and, and do your first staking. Um, and so again, I really like this quote unquote Satoshi's vision, right? This idea, I, I shouldn't use the term Satoshi's vision because I feel like that's been um, appropriated for other purposes recently, but, but basically just permissionless value creation, right? The idea that again, without needing any uh, special account, any identification, any KYC AML process, any token, I can just like turn on a piece of hardware and begin mining and begin earning tokens. I think that's a very powerful vision. Um, yeah, I won't go too deeply into this, but this is, this is uh, the way researchers, people smarter than me, talk about uh, just these security assumptions um, baked into proof of stake, right? Proof of work is relatively easy to reason about from a security perspective. There's a certain amount of hash power securing a network, a certain number of dollars that are um, paying for a certain number of CPU cycles. Proof of stake is, is just kind of, it's sort of recursive in its security model um, in that in order for the network to be secure, the token has to have value, right? Because if the token has no value, then slashing me doesn't hurt me at all. Um, but in order for the token to have value, the network has to be secure, right? And so you kind of very quickly get into this like recursive loop. Uh, again, I'm not suggesting that it can't work, right? I think that the US dollar works the same way, right? We have confidence in the dollar because it's got the full faith and credit of the U.S. government behind it, and the U.S. government, um, you know, we can put our faith in it because, among other things, the dollar is strong. It's a very similar story. Uh, it's just harder to reason about, harder to understand. And again, you know, researchers say it has these non-standard assumptions for security. Uh, and and I think it, you know, it's not so terribly hard to imagine a scenario where, given how volatile cryptocurrencies are, um, there's some black swan event and the price of the token drops. 10%, 50%, whatever that number is, and you kind of end up in a death spiral, right? Because once the token drops, people lose confidence in the network. When they lose confidence in the network, the token drops further, et cetera. Um, and, and this is one as well that kind of scares me, right? Is that um, in a proof of stake network, if at any point a single party or a group of parties acquire effectively 51% of the stake in the network, then uh, it, it's similar to a 51% attack in, you know, in the case of proof of work mining, they kind of, in, in, in theory, control the network. Um, but the difference is in proof of stake, there's a couple of differences, right? One is that because it's not permissionless, right? In proof of work network, for sake of argument, assume that some mining pool or something achieves this threshold, achieves 51% mining. Someone somewhere else can just fire up more miners and, and, and sort of um, bump that down permissionlessly. In proof of stake, it, it leads to this potentially very scary scenario where a very small number of stakeholders um, have the stake and can't be bumped because again it's not permissionless and if they're not selling that stake uh, and they decide to you know i don't know maybe issuance is very low or something um or there's you know they're just not opening up validation slots um the, the network in theory could could be captured and it, it what's even more scary about it is that you may not know that it happens right because um it's it's very unlikely that it's going to be a single entity with all their tokens in a single wallet. It's much more likely that they're going to be spread across across multiple wallets, and we we just don't know, right? Who who owns those wallets? Like what sort of meat space humans or entities that maps to? And it's easy to say this sounds ridiculous and absurd, but if you look at the actual wealth distribution in networks like Ethereum and Bitcoin today, it's not so great. So yeah, that's something that kind of kind of scares me. Um, so let's talk about sharding as well, right? So sharding uh, is another, um, you know, pretty exciting technology uh, that, um, you know, great projects like uh, Ethereum and, and Nier are working on, uh, many others as well. Um, you know, projects like, um, like Polkadot have a very different approach to scalability involving parachains, but I, I really think if you kind of zoom out to the highest level, uh, there are, of course, differences around security and around kind of virtual machine and things like that. But it's, it's very similar is what I'm saying, right? Anytime you have kind of like, um, instead of a single logical namespace, a single logical um, uh, chain, right, where, where kind of all your like data and contracts live, you kind of split them up over a bunch of places. 
So um, my opinion, and I'm, I'm again gonna, you know, own my ignorance here. Like I am not an expert in sharding, you guys are. So like one thing we might wanna do is like, I'd, I'd love to hear you refute these points, you guys. Um, but my limited understanding of sharding is that it makes a lot of sense in the case of databases, right? So if you think about something like, you know, like Twitter is a big database, right? If I post a tweet uh, right here, right now, it doesn't matter if it takes, you know, 10 seconds or 10 minutes for that tweet to like um, be propagated to like, you know, my, my, my friends or my family looking at it in North America. Uh, and that's a property called eventual consistency of databases. And, and so they could be multiple shards and right, um, you, can, you can kind of, uh, it, it, I would, you get what I'm saying, right? It doesn't, the data doesn't need to be immediately consistent everywhere. The problem with blockchains is that it does, right? Because blockchains are money. And if it takes a minute or 10 minutes for, the, for, the, for a transaction to propagate um, across all the shards, across the globe, um, then you have a potential for double spending. Um, and, and as a result of this, it makes composability of, of smart contracts very, very difficult, right? So in a nutshell, I think that um, the, the most exciting thing about uh, the developer experience on a platform like Ethereum is, is this, this really nice property called composability, right? And what this means is that um, if some developer deploys an application, like in the case of Ethereum, we talk about Maker is a great example, right? So there's CDPs, there's DAI out there, um, and then there's like CryptoKitties, right? I can come along and I can like build something that calls into both of those, right? So I can, I can you know, go to some ETH Global Hackathon, which you should do because they're great, and I can build, uh, I don't know, Kitty Hat Trading Marketplace or something, right? And, and the, the, the most important part here is like, I don't need the permission of the maker team. I don't need the permission of Dapper Labs and the CryptoKitties folks. I can just write a smart contract. And by the way, many people have done this, right? That like, you know, takes a CryptoKitty and I don't know, I'm just making stuff up here, you know, like buys a hat using DAI and, or mints, you know, or, or even better, collateralizes a new CDP using a CryptoKitty or something. I think someone actually did that about a year ago. Um, this is like a fantastic example of something called permissionless innovation, right? Which is that, which is the exact opposite of what you can do on web two platforms. So like Facebook's and Twitter's where you need the permission of the developer to use their API. That's the point. And this is what makes web three apps. One of the main things that makes web three apps so much better than web two apps, right? Is this just this ability to go on permissionlessly and compose things. So sharding makes that very, very hard uh, for a bunch of reasons. Um, the main one being that, um, you may want an app that lives on one shard, like, 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 like how do you compose apps that live on different shards? Um, you end up messages, you know, with messages moving across shards, you know, in the case of Ethereum, it's through this like beacon chain thing, or in the case of Polkadot, um, you have a relay chain where, you know, messages are flowing from one, um, one relay chain to another, sorry, one parachain to another. Uh, and that introduces a few things, right? It has to be done asynchronously, all the designs I've seen. Um, and so it's, you know, it takes, it can take minutes to, you know, for finality and one chain to, to happen. Um, and, and so this has been nicely encapsulated by Andrew Miller in something called the train and hotel problem, which is, um, if I'm going on a trip and I want to book a hotel ticket, and I also want to book a train to that city, I want both. I don't want one. And I don't want the other. Right. And this is a problem of, um, what's called atomicity in computer science. We want this transaction to be atomic. Basically, if there's no availability on the hotel, I don't want the train ticket. And if I can't get the train ticket, I don't want the hotel ticket. So it's all or nothing. Um, and and the, the kind of like, so if the train is on one shard and the hotel's in another shard, right, you get this very complicated scenario where I have to go to one and then, and, then, and then somehow get some sort of receipt or ticket and take it to the other. It's not impossible. It can be done. And there's a lot of cool designs. But it's just um, like I, my, in a nutshell, my opinion is that the developer experience and the user experience on platforms like Ethereum is already pretty crappy. And I think sharding makes this worse uh, by an order of magnitude. Um, there was a talk on the first day of DevCon um, on this. Who, whose talk was that? Right. Uh, so James did a talk on this. And I think he described uh, sharding as like a, um, an asteroid that's like hurtling towards Earth. And we're just in the context specifically of Ethereum 2, right? And we're just kind of beginning to get a handle on this. So I'm going to stop talking about this now. I urge you to look into it. I know that you guys have some really interesting ideas in, in Nightshade, I think is that what it's called, which is your sharding design. Uh, Vitalik has also responded to some of this, these, these um, ideas in a series of posts, which he tweeted about, and they're also on ETH Research. Um, but it is a concern I have for sharding. Uh, so I talked about, yeah, it makes 
developer experience, user experience harder. Um, and as I already said as well, uh, other types of kind of scaling solutions, things including side chains um, and layer two solutions, state channels um, or um, plasma, that kind of stuff has similar issues, right? Again, you want to compose applications that live in you know, two different state channels or something, it's, it's hard. So my feeling is that um, we can do better. I think we, you know, as we kind of approach the third generation or whatever we're on of blockchains now, we kind of have a decent understanding of a lot of these problems. Um, and, and that's my personal motivation for working on Space Mesh. As I kind of zoomed out a few months ago, surveyed the landscape, um, learned about a number of amazing projects. Um, you know, no project is perfect, but I feel that Space Mesh has chosen a very interesting solution, uh, a point on the solution space. Um, with respect to a lot of the trade-offs we're discussing here. So next section, I will uh, introduce some of these ideas. So um, the first and most important one is this idea of a proof of space time, which sounds like super Star Trek-y or something to me. I was always wondering what proof of space time means, but so I'll introduce kind of the idea here. So the concept is that um, you, so, so space refers to hard drive space and time refers to um, how long you allocate that space. And so in a nutshell, the idea is that you fill up a portion of your hard drive with cryptographic junk, right? Let's call it 100 gigabytes worth, and you keep it for, let's say, a month, right? So then the unit of space time would be 100 gigabyte months, which if you've ever used Microsoft Azure or Amazon AWS, like that's how you get billed for services like EC, uh, sorry, not EC2, for uh, S3 or any of these like storage services, um, right? So you have to prove that you generated this, um, this data, this cryptographic junk, and that you kept it for a period of time. And the idea here is that it replaces proof of work. So it's a lot like proof of work. It's permissionless the way proof of work is, but instead of burning electricity and running your CPU, you're just storing junk on your hard drive, which, uh, which is much more environmentally efficient, even including the cost of the hard drive itself. Uh, okay, so space times time, we talked about that. So there's two phases to this. The first is what's called an initialization phase. Um, this is where Space Mesh gets its civil resistance from. Um, and so there is an initial proof of work phase, right? So you need to run sort of one CPU, one core at maximum capacity for some period of time, call it a day or two, to initially perform this, this, this step of filling up um, that amount of space with, 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 the, with the cryptographic junk, right? Um, and that's kind of your stake. That's kind of your skin in the game here. There's no slashing. Um, there's no there's no stake. There's no bonding. But if you misbehave, then like you will have wasted um, that amount of time and electricity, um, right? And so the idea here is that um, you can't you can't send all the data over the network to someone else to prove that you have it uh, because it's too much. We're talking about hundreds of gigabytes. Um, so you need to be able to create the data yourself, and then you need to be able to kind of um, prove to someone in a, in a fancy cryptographic way that you've done this process. Um, yeah, and, and again, every epoch, which is currently set to about two weeks, you need to kind of submit another proof to prove that you still have the data. Uh, so that's the theory and how it actually works in practice. Um, as I said a moment ago, right, you can't submit an ideal proof. There's some interesting data theoretic um, uh, I guess, yeah, theories that, that suggest that the only way to like completely perfectly assert that I have exactly the data I say I have is to send all the data. Obviously you can't do that, it's not practical. Uh, so what you do is you uh, send what's called a commitment to just a seed piece of data. And um, not surprisingly, the data structure we use is a Merkle tree and the, the commitment that you're sharing is the root of the tree. Um, and then the adversary can, uh, the, 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 sorry, the challenger um, who's uh, on the receiving end of this proof can simulate that computation and make sure that you uh, have what you said you have, um, right? And so when you submit a subsequent proof, you have two choices. You can either store the data, actually store the data for that two weeks, or you could lie and say you stored the data for two weeks, but actually delete it and then regenerate it, right? And uh, the point is, these are what are called rational proofs of storage, right? So any rational actor would choose to store the data rather than recreating it because, as I suggested a moment ago, uh, it's quite expensive to compute. And again, these are all parameters and that can be tweaked and that are being tweaked in the testnet right now. Um, right, so, so that's rational proof of storage, yeah? Can I have a question? Of course. You just mentioned that on Amazon S3 storage is how you get your, I mean, CPU is another way, but 
is, is the CPU much more costly than the storage even on Amazon? Can you repeat the question? Yeah, yeah. The question was, um, basically, is CPU more expensive than storage, like, for instance, in, in Amazon Web Services? Um, and I guess what you're hinting at here is, like, how do we know that it's cheaper to store it than to recompute it, right? And the answer is, uh, we can set these, these are parameters. We can set them to whatever we want. Um, and uh, it will be set in such a way. And I'm, the numbers I'm giving you here are rough estimates, right? If you were to run a, a single core CPU for 48 hours at, at full throttle, um, that will cost you some tens of US dollars in electricity or AWS, um, whereas just storing the data for that same period of time would cost pennies. So any rational actor would be incentivized to just store the data. I have a second question. Sure. Very quickly. Um, is, so you generated it, and, and you have to set up the proof, but is there like a more interactive process whereby the, the node can be queried at maybe random places where it actually has the value for that random spot? Sure. So, so there's this regular proving process that happens every two weeks. And the question is, um, is it possible or I guess is there a need to prove like in a more random fashion? Like, could you like, like, I think of this as like, I'm running a restaurant and the department of, you know, whatever restaurant safety is like randomly showing up at my door unannounced. Uh, so I, uh, you know, to, to, to inspect my restaurant and see if it's clean in the kitchen, something like that. Right. Uh, I think the, so, so my, my understanding is that there's just no need for that. You're going to get checked every two weeks and like, what could happen? I mean, I guess you could be offline, right? So like all you'd be proving is that like you're online at that point in time, if it was like a random check, but I don't think that's required by the protocol for you to be online, except when you need to submit these proofs. I, I don't see a reason um, why you would need to do that. I don't think you would get anything from that. So your answer is that the parameters have to be tuned that Recalculating is more expensive than Yeah, exactly. The parameters need to be tuned such that recalculating um, by, so again, by a rational actor would always be more expensive than just storing the data. That's exactly right. And it can be tweaked. Yep. Can you go on to what you mean by cryptographic jump? I mean, if you look yeah. at a file point or something that I'm just store jump that right. so why, why is it jump? Yeah, no, that's an excellent question. So the question is, what do I mean by cryptographic junk and, and um, why would you want to store junk uh, compared to like a Filecoin where you're, where you're actually storing meaningful data? Um, so Filecoin has a, a mechanism which I believe is also called space-time or proof of space-time. I don't have a very deep, thorough understanding of it. Um, what I can tell you is that, so we're sort of simulating proof-of-work mining here, right? And in proof-of-work mining, you're doing pointless computation. You're literally spinning a CPU trillions of times uh, looking for a nonce, right? Just so I call it solving a cryptographic puzzle. And it's not meaningful work. Like the only outcome or output of that work is that you mine a block. Um, and there have been interesting attempts in the past um, by other protocols to do more meaningful work, right? So there's one called PrimeCoin that folks might be familiar with where you're like trying to solve prime numbers. Um, there have been people who talked about doing other like meaningful work. The problem is with doing that is that it makes the economics much more complicated. Um, if, if there's a market for that work that's being done, then um, it makes like certain types of bribery attacks and things like that much easier, right? Because uh, I'm not wasting, like the point here is that as a miner, I have skin in the game, right? I'm like, I have something at stake. I'm, I'm, I'm throwing something away such that if I misbehave, uh, I will have burned that for nothing. Right, I will have like spent these thousands of dollars or these whatever you know enormous amount of money to produce a bad block. I'm not going to get rewarded for it. I'm going to get punished by the protocol, which is how it works in proof of work. Whereas on the other hand, if I could still go sell that work, right, then um, I, I think it increases the likelihood of attack in a network. And I think so. So again, this is a simulation of that using, which is why we call it junk. Um, Filecoin is a very, very, very different protocol. Uh, and yeah, to be clear, you are storing other people's data, which I think is encrypted and striped and stuff like that. Um, but I don't understand the like protocol well enough to, to, co to compare them deeply. It's a good question. Uh, so yeah, said this a couple times, rational actors will always prefer to store the data. That's the idea. And it doesn't, from the perspective of the protocol, it makes no difference, right? If you want to delete the data and recompute it, that's cool. It just, you're just wasting money by doing so. Oh, hey. You came up a second ago. We were talking about sharding. Maybe we'll talk more about it later. Uh, sweet. So um, malicious adversaries still resource limited. Yeah, so um, even if you were to kind of stage an attack or attempt to stage an attack on the network, um, 
just like in proof of work mining, you know, you, 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 you know, can go pay for as much hard drive space as you want or as much CPU power as you want, but it's going to be very expensive to attack the network. The same reason that it's expensive to attack a proof of work network. Um, so the, the, the updated assumption, right? So the assumption in the case of Bitcoin, let me rewind even more. So the magic of Satoshi's uh, creation, right, of, of the Bitcoin proof of work protocol is that um, it replaces this 51% honest majority assumption uh, with 51% of honest resources, right? So rather than trying to map to individual people, it's kind of like a rough approximation. We're kind of saying 51% of CPUs or, or computers or whatever are honest. And in the case of space mesh, it's the CPU work, the initial CPU work plus the storage. So it's the same exact argument as Bitcoin. It, it really is, is very similar to Bitcoin's proof of work um, and, and Ethereum's proof of work um, protocol. Uh, and yeah, measured in terms of cost. So we have construction of these proofs called proof of space time, which um, it's very, it's pretty complicated and I won't have time in this talk to go into the details, but um, there's a very thorough protocol paper, a white paper on the website, which I urge you to check out. And uh, if we have time today, we can talk about it in more details. Um, to Alex, to your question, right? So this is all parameters that could be tweaked. We can adjust the difficulty uh, for that initial um, account generation process, um, independent of the other parameters. Um, and, and just like Bitcoin, right, there's like a market-based mechanism. So when Bitcoin has more people mine, the mining difficulty goes up. That's in the protocol. The exact same thing can happen here. If it turns out that someone is generating these proofs more quickly, it's supposed to take about two weeks from epoch to epoch. If the protocol discovers that it's happening faster than that, then the difficulty can go up automatically. This is all part of the protocol. Um, and so I just want to go back to, you know, just come out of the weeds for a second and just reemphasize why this matters. Um, to me, it matters primarily because of this permissionlessness, right? I have a very clear vision in my head and it, I don't know yet whether it's possible or not, but, but the vision is that any human anywhere on earth with access to effectively consumer grade hardware, right? In the ideal case, someday that may be a smartphone for now, that's, you know, let's say a consumer grade laptop or a, a gaming computer, um, can turn it on, download a piece of software, run it and just start collecting tokens, right? Without, without any permission, without needing, um, as I said before, without needing you know, to hit an exchange or buy, you know, buy tokens or get KYC AML or anything like that. Um, I think that's a very powerful idea, this, this idea of permissionless value creation and permissionless um, participation in these value creation networks. Um, you know, I'll preempt another question people probably have at this moment, which is uh, why is this more like quote unquote ASIC resistant than Bitcoin or Ethereum? Um, you know, in the case of Bitcoin and Ethereum, we have these professional mining farms and mining pools um, with, you know, ASICs, et cetera. In the case of uh, Space Mesh, it's, it's more about storage. So why couldn't we have uh, someone come up and, and just buy, you know, petabytes and petabytes of storage on, you know, AWS or some cloud provider or something? And the answer is uh, they can do that, but their marginal cost is going to be greater than zero for doing so, right? Marginal cost per, you know, per byte or whatever. Um, because... Storage is cheap, but it's non-zero cost. And uh, there's a lot of associated costs. There's like DevOps costs and there's redundancy costs and things like that as you scale up. Um, in contrast, if you are a solo miner, right? Again, think of the target demographic as like a 15 year old gamer with like a middle of the road gaming PC. They've probably got hundred gigabytes of extra hard drive space. Um, and so their marginal cost is very, very, very close to zero. They're not buying any hardware to do this. They're not really, there's a tiny little period in the beginning, as I said, of, of generating an identity. Um, but after that, there's no ongoing CPU cost. It's very, very quick. Uh, and so the idea here is that um, you can never be priced out of the market by, um, by mining farms or by whales. And um, um, the other, another nice property of the protocol, which I didn't have a chance to go into, is that it's race free. Right? So in the case of Bitcoin or Ethereum, you have these miners racing at every block height to produce the next block, which is why it's a chain. You get a single block, single block, single block, right? Uh, space mesh is called a mesh because it's not a chain. It's, um, it's, a, it's a DAG. It's, a, it's an acyclic graph. What I mean by that is that there's many blocks at each block height. Um, and it, just another nice property of a protocol like this, right? Every miner who successfully submitted a um, validity proof, basically one of these proofs of space time that they, that they still have this data in their possession um, in the previous epoch is eligible to mine in the current epoch. 
And not at every, we call them layers, these block heights, right? Layers because there's, there's hundreds or thousands of blocks in a layer. Um, um, every miner is guaranteed to be able to produce many blocks per epoch. And this scales to the order of about a million uh, miners, which is a very, a very large number. Um, so race free, which is really cool. Um, you don't need to join a mining pool because you'll be collecting um, rewards uh, as, a, as a solo miner, right? You're, you're eligible to produce multiple blocks per layer, uh, sorry, per epoch. And, uh, and this is where the protocol gets its inherent scalability without sharding, which I think is really cool, right? As I said, there's you know, something on the order of 100, you know, 400 blocks in a single layer. Um, that's you know, three-ish orders of magnitude more transaction throughput than Bitcoin or Ethereum out of the gate, and it, it can scale up further as the protocol gets more mature. Uh, cool. All right. So that's a lot. That's like an, a very high level introduction to the space mesh protocol. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the VM and smart contracts, which is the second half of this talk and sort of the title um, of the event. But before I do that, let me just pause and see if there are any other questions about all the protocol stuff. Yeah. In front. Yeah. I have a question on the remark. So for the remark, yes, your assumption about proof of stake has been uh, less inclusive because there is an additional step. Well, for the people who are, let's say, tech savvy, as they need to uh, go to Amazon, set up the thing, download and stuff, I don't think it's an obstacle to just go to the exchange. And, I mean, it's similar, but I agree with you that there's a step to get on liquidity. And same, it would be great to see uh, some numbers yes, for the assumption about sure. And cost of CPU versus sure. the data. Sure. So we can argue that, okay, maybe there is an ASICs to be Created a cryptographic proof. I mean, it still takes some time, yes, at the beginning, at the first place, yep. to compute the chunk of data. Yep. And then probably there is some change. So yep. one can argue that, uh, okay, maybe there is some ethics to it, but do it quickly and be on similar level to uh, to the states. Yep. Yeah, cool. So my question is, in fact, uh, related to this uh, tag. How do you ensure that you know, there are no conflicts and that was fine? Okay. Um, let me try to repeat what you said for the purpose of the recording. So the first comment was, so the second comment you said was, it'd be nice to see some hard numbers with respect to the costs of you know, the, 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 the compute part as well as the storage part. Um, I have numbers, I'd be happy to share them. They're not in this presentation, but if you find me afterwards, there's been research work done on that. Um, the first thing you mentioned was um, that it's maybe not strictly permissionless if what you need to do to be able to mine is actually you know, go to AWS and, and provision some storage space and install some software on it. Um, I disagree, right? Because the, the vision here is not that you're doing this on AWS. The vision is that, I mean, you can if you want to, right? But the vision is that you already have extra hard drive space on your own computer. So what you need is a computer, like I said, a um, middle of the road, like average computer, uh, probably not a laptop. Probably, again, we're targeting more like gamers with desktops that are going to be plugged in and kind of online all the time. Uh, and that's it. Like, yeah. we have a piece of software. You can download and run it. There's no cloud provisioning. There's no credit card. It's just, you're just good to go like that. And my argument was just related that if somebody is, you know, has the hardware, is able to install more advanced software than buying the crypto or the tokens, which assuming they are liquid, if they're not liquid, then it's, it's very clear the recommend is it's very clear, yes. That probably the same like, level of, of difficulty. Uh, cool. Yeah. I still disagree, respectfully, um, because I, I think of, as I, I keep saying, this 15-year-old who's in some random country somewhere in the world who doesn't have a credit card, uh, I don't see them being able to acquire tokens. There's, 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 a, there's something like a billion desktop computers in the world today. So anyway, it's, it's a very valid point. So thank you for bringing it up. And, and I want to admit as well, like we, we don't know if that part will work, right? That's one of those things you can't simulate. You have to kind of release it in the wild and see who your users are. Is it, does it end up being mining farms? Does it end up being home users? Um, and your question was about the, the Merkle tree, the proofs. What was, can you restate the last question you asked? So um, since you've done the DAG, the DAG, uh, sorry, the DAG, yeah. Two uh, blocks, let's say, being produced in parallel. Yep. How do you assure that there is no problem ah. lending? Right, okay, so because there are multiple blocks at each block height, at each layer, how do we uh, make sure there's no double spending? The short answer to your question is that there's a, like a strict ordering of transactions and ordering of blocks. And so the same transaction can end up in multiple blocks. It doesn't matter. It's only the first one counts. Like, as long as there's a strict ordering, then you, like, then... Um, 
multiple blocks can be unwound into into a chain effectively, right? There is a strict ordering of everything. Yeah, but someone has to check if there is no conflict. Check if, what do you mean by check if there's no conflict? So let's say that, that both of us will produce the, the, the block even though there is strict ordering, since we don't know, I mean, if we are doing it in parallel, then we don't know if we are not processing the same thing. <coughs> The yes. question is how you order the blocks, essentially. Yeah, so this is another parameter that's being worked out, how, how the ordering happens. But yeah. you, can you can think of it as... Yeah, but in two blocks, even though that's partial order, in two blocks... Since there the it's not partial order, it's total order. There's a single strict total ordering. Yeah, like, lots of blocks produced in parallel, but everybody validates every single block. Yeah. Everyone gets every block, and everyone agrees on the ordering, the, the strict total ordering of every, every transaction in the block and every block. So it, it unwinds into a chain, basically. Okay. Okay. It's like naturally this does not scale, and definitely not to three orders of magnitude over. What doesn't scale? Well, if you run it in the regular hardware, you cannot validate like two, three hundred transactions. Uh, like EVM, and then, you know, there's that, <coughs> that so, like, there is limit how much one machine can sure. do. There's a limit to how much, yeah, there's a limit, uh, okay, yes, there's a limit to how much, um, how many transactions a single machine can validate. I agree with that. Cool. Uh, yeah. I have a question to the, the, the green, the content that the green claim on that, which I saw at the first time, they also did that, they said, like, it's green because it's proof of space, um, which I think is the same project you guys do. Um, I mean, we know, like, from the estimates of Bitcoin energy waste that, those estimates are based on like the reward that people actually make, right? And the idea is they're making so much reward, so they want to spend that minus a little margin. Up to their, up, right, up to where the point where the marginal cost equals the marginal reward, exactly. exactly. Yeah. That's what they do. So yeah. Then, you you want to have the same, right? Just the investment. Yep. What you buy is energy and hard disk, yep. I guess, right? So, but buying hard disk is that actually like, at that size you will get to, right? Let's assume your point is also 10,000. So sure. Or, is buying and producing hard disks actually greener and maybe them, you know, than, than anything else because you will have so much hard disk crash. And then going then a bit further into your asking question, isn't this then promoting the development of like one kind of hard disk things or something like big tape systems that are only special? Sure. Kind of problem? So, okay, so it's a very valid question. Uh, it's a very difficult question to answer. Just, just to, to kind of attempt to restate the question for the recording. Um, if if this ends up working the way that proof of work mining works, then aren't we incentivizing people to buy up tons and tons and tons of hard drives and kind of I think you described it as right once, kind of just dump a bunch of stuff onto them and, and kind of uh, yeah, isn't it, isn't it still wasteful in the, in the in the sense that people are going to be you know producing yeah the resources required to produce the hard drives? Um, I, I I'm I'm not going to try to answer this question because it's a very very difficult question and there's a lot of kind of variables here. Um, I think. Again, just to restate, like the vision here is that there are so many people who have already owned hard drives with extra space on them, and their marginal cost is going to be much lower than the marginal cost of those folks. The economics wouldn't make sense for someone to go out and, and purchase petabytes and petabytes worth of new hard drive space to do it, because the economics will be such that the reward will be too low for them. That's the vision. Okay. Again, this needs to be proven. Yeah, it was asking because like first kind is doing it since 2040, so okay. there's some experience values already. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, so so Burstcoin has been doing this since, since 2014. I'm not familiar with that project, but I will look into it. I appreciate the tip. Yeah. Quick question. So the token will appreciate, right? Like if they... I have I have nothing to say about token price. I, I mean, like, like, but that's like built into the incentive mechanism is someone thinks the tokens are going to be worth something. Or not. I mean, yeah. I. I I have nothing to say about token price. Like the question, the question was, wouldn't someone want to earn tokens with the understanding that they'd appreciate? I mean, okay, in the sense that, like from day one, sure, right? It's a network. It's a very small network in the beginning. Not many people know about it. Not many people are using it. But if if it has the potential we say it has, then yeah, I mean that is that's why I'd be incentivized to mine in the beginning. Right. I mean, I, I, if you're not willing to take the the assumption that tokens are going to be worth something, then it's like the nice follow up is like a worthless question, right? But well, no, but but actually, I don't think it requires. It has to be worth something greater than zero, right? But the point is again. And if my marginal cost to do it is so low, I don't care that much whether I'm making a dollar a week, ten dollars a week, a hundred dollars a week. It's still something, right? Yeah, but it's so not, still not clear that uh, your hardware that you have for near zero cost is still be able to compete with someone who buys and masterizes. 
you, you can, right? So the question is, how do we know that your, your commodity hardware can compete with, with a mining farm or something? And the answer, again, goes back to economics, right? My marginal cost will always be lower than the marginal cost of a professional miner, always. Again, it's very close to zero. So um, I don't need a very large reward. So, so but, but this is the interesting thing is, say the network is really small and I'm some like super rich dude and I'm like, oh, I actually really believe in space mesh. And because of that, I'm gonna like, go and buy a sure. of storage. Sure, sure, and sure. Then, with the whole intent being like, today it's gonna not make sense, but I'm amortizing my cost over like, the tenant's return. To fame's is storage as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, yes, okay, so. Sure, I the idea here is so actually this is what we're telling people there's no there's no token sale okay there was there was a there was a private sale to investors a couple of years ago uh, if you want to acquire space mesh tokens today the only way you can do it is by becoming a miner um, that's it and so yes there will be people who are very excited about this network um, and do want to spin up you know like a ton of whatever cloud storage or something and, and mine that way and that's that's a way of but it's the only way of buying tokens. Um, I think that's okay. I think that that's a good um, bootstrapping mechanism, and hopefully that you know spreads the, the tokens out more. Um, and I still think again, if the economics work, then that's it's still more decentralized. So it's, still, it's still like a positive feature. Yeah, that's how I would think about it. It's still, yeah. Yeah, I was just going to say. I think what really is heartbreaking is when you see those videos of like. Um, Lift trucks like taking all the Shell two five six machines and putting them into landfill. Yeah. And at least the, the good thing about this idea is that even if you do sort of buy loads of storage, at least they're useful hard drives. Yeah. And you can actually, you know, they're not going to go straight into the ground, which I think is a yeah. So Owen's point here, which I agree with, is that it's tragic to see videos, uh, as we've seen coming out of places like China, of forklifts dumping, you know, ASICs, Bitcoin ASICs or whatever, and throwing them into into landfills. Um, and the nice thing about uh, using something like using a piece of commodity hardware, like a hard drive, is that it's a generally useful piece of hardware. The same is true for GPUs, which I think is why people like uh, algorithms like ETHash and ProgPal. Um, okay, I'll take one more question on protocol, then I want to keep moving. How scalable would the space mesh be? Like what's the transaction num throughput numbers you are looking at? So if the barrier of entries to be a miner is very low, so if there's a huge num numbers of miner, like 500, 1,000, sure. then what will be the throughput? And then how will we affect the finality? Okay, so the question is about throughput and finality. Um, so the protocol scales to hundreds of thousands of miners, and that's the target. Um, the, so there are limits on the number of blocks that can be produced at each layer. Um, I don't know the latest parameters. I think it's, I think for the purposes of the test net, it's something on the order of about 400 blocks per layer. Uh, and we also haven't figured out the exact block size yet, but for sake of argument, let's assume that it's the same size as an Ethereum block and has a similar number of transactions, which is not a crazy assumption. Um, that's 400 times the capacity of Ethereum. And that doesn't require, like these numbers are being achieved now with, um, you know, I don't know, 100 miners or something that we've been running in cloud instances. So um, I don't know. I, like, I, I, I think that that's enough for now, right? But it, the, the nice thing about this protocol is that, like, that number will increase as the parameters are tweaked and the protocol improves and things. So I think it can, can be very scalable at layer one. And it's still compatible with all the other layer two stuff if you want to deploy Plasma or something on top of it. Uh, I'm sorry, did you have, was there a second piece to your question? Or was that it? Uh, I mean, it depends on the size of the transactions, but it's, you know, thousands, 4,000, 8,000, something like that. So that would be how many nodes? Based on how many Sorry, it, yeah, 400 blocks per layer, not per second. Uh, a block can have dozens of transactions. And in, in the case of Ethereum, it's something like 100 transactions in a block, right? So 400 blocks times 100, right? That's 40,000 transactions per layer. A layer is on the order of about five minutes, so you can do the math. Uh, okay, is it... Is it a quick one? So if a lot of CPU intensive protocols have tried to be shipped directly in, for example, gaming applications, whether it be on desktop or phone, the reason companies don't want to do that is because it drains mad and power faster, which is extra CPU intensive to the user. Um, since yours is supposed to be less CPU intensive, yep. much more hardware storage intensive, which a lot of these photos add, so if it's one gigabyte on your phone or 20 gigabytes on your desktop, why don't you your distribution strategy trying to shift in those applications natively instead of you know, the guy who wants to fill 100 gigabytes of hard drive space randomly. 
So the, I understood everything except the very last piece. What do you mean by ship them natively? Ship what natively? To whom? Is the other already stored in 20 gigabytes of whatever random data they have? Right? On mobile devices or on? On desktop or because it's not related to World of Warcraft. Yeah, but why, why don't you guys appeal to the companies with a huge distribution strategy already on devices that are storing right. amounts of data across Right, the okay, thank you. Yeah, so why, why don't why don't we why don't we uh, as a distribution channel work with companies that are already doing things that are that are distributing things like games onto devices that have uh, a lot of storage on them already? And the answer is we are. Yeah, so it's, it's a great idea. Uh, cool. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna move on to part two and dive into the, um, the 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 VM stuff briefly. How are we doing on time? Okay, blockchain virtual machines. What do we have now? Everyone knows what Bitcoin Script is. Bitcoin Script got dumber a year later for security reasons. Um, some clever people tried doing, tried to kind of pigeonhole some like things into Bitcoin and that kind of sucks, right? So you kind of have like op return and stuff. Everyone knows what Ethereum and EVM are. Um, and then these things called precompiles were created because there's a lot of expensive but interesting things that are difficult to do in Solidity inside the VM and Ethereum like uh, cryptography. Um, so what is WASM, right? So WASM stands for WebAssembly. It's a new technology that's emerged over the past year or two. Uh, it's uh, effectively an instruction set, so a virtual machine. It's not a hardware instruction set like um, uh, like x86 or AMD is. Um, it is a software instruction set, a virtual machine instruction set, but it looks a little bit like um, a risk instruction set, which is a hardware instruction set. Um, it doesn't map to any particular piece of hardware, which is nice. It's kind of like this idealized uh, hardware, idealized CPU. Um, that's not as interesting. It doesn't have weird high-level instructions. So if you look at other virtual machines like Java or EVM, uh, they have they they don't look anything like hardware. Um, Wasm is designed to look a lot like hardware, which is nice. It makes it more efficient and more uh, uh, interoperable across different platforms. Um, its design is being led by the World Wide Web Consortium by a working group. Um, version one was finalized recently. Um, why do we like it? Uh, so standards are rapidly emerging. WASI is a good example of this. WASI stands for WASM System Interface. And it's, uh, so originally WASM was designed to run inside the web browser, to, to run binary applications at near native speed inside a web browser. And there's some really cool demos you can play with around like 3D games and all sorts of applications are emerging now. Um, but now it's, it's uh, being standardized to run outside the web browser. A lot like Node.js allowed JavaScript applications to be run in the command line. Um, it's very, very fast, achieving up to 80%, 90% of native speed in theory, right? That requires optimizing compilers to, to achieve. Uh, it's very safe. It's designed to be sandboxed and run inside um, like a browser tab, um, inside the document object model without touching the rest of the system. Um, in theory, that requires some work. Uh, there are other alternatives out there, and we think it's like, like the eWASM team spent some time evaluating. I'm sure you guys did as well, and like we decided this is like the nicest thing out there. Supported in all the browsers, um, there's support in dozens of languages for it. So that's a really nice thing, right? Rather than being forced to write your smart contracts in Solidity or Viper, you can do it in C or C++ or Rust or um, AssemblyScript or a bunch of other cool languages. Uh, and the support in the Rust ecosystem has been getting better and better and better. There's really, really, really powerful tools now um, that allow you to write um, Rust code and decorate it in such a way that uh, it can be, you know, tied very neatly into like web applications and, and hopefully blockchain applications too. Um, it can be made deterministic. We'll talk more about that cross-platform. Uh, we think of it in the Ethereum world as like the precompile to end all precompiles, right? So the idea here is it becomes cheap enough and fast enough for any developer to, dis to develop a smart contract uh, that does complex stuff like cryptography and optimize it. And we no longer need these like uh, annoying kind of precompiles, which uh, need to go in as hard forks to uh, to blockchains like Ethereum. Uh, how do we do it? So um, simple math. So in the case of Space Mesh, SWASM or EWASM or, or near WASM or PWASM in the case of Polkadot is basically WASM uh, minus sources of non-determinism. Uh, everything that happens on chain has to be perfectly deterministic and, and perfectly re replicable across all the machines in the network. So we remove uh, things like floating point support, uh, which is not perfectly deterministic. Um, we add these things called host functions so a WASM 
application lives inside this thing called a module, which is completely self-contained and completely sandboxed from the rest of the world. It has no way to like open a file or make a network connection or something. And so the way that works is that we do what's called in injecting host functions, right? So in the case of a blockchain like Ethereum um, or Space Mesh or Near or whatever, you want to inject a function that would let you, you know, uh, send tokens or create a new transaction or write to storage or read storage, things like that. Uh, and of course, we need to add metering as well for blockchains. Uh, so that is effectively, that's it in a nutshell. It's pretty, it's pretty simple arithmetic. Um, this, uh, this slide and, and some of the other stuff in this section um, come from some previous eWASM presentations. So uh, thank you to Alex Bergsassi and other folks who contributed to those. So this is an example um, of what metering looks like, right? So this is sort of unrolling, a, well, it's not really unrolling, but we're looking at um, branching on the left. This is kind of the original code. And then we can meter just the branches here um, by using, so this is what uh, the injection looks like. There's some function that we import called use gas. And then um, uh, when the smart contract gets deployed onto the blockchain, we inject these uh, use gas statements to do the metering. Um, I'm just going to load this whole thing. So um, there's still a lot of challenges outstanding for, for Wasm on the blockchain. Um, a lot. It's like a really, really hard thing to do. And Iwasm and other teams um, have been, you know, kind of working on these things for a while. So the tooling is, is getting better, but it's still quite immature. Um, there's, there's a dozen ish Wasm engines out there, but a lot of them are themselves quite immature. Um, and, and one of the challenging things about using something like Wasm, like an existing technology in a blockchain like Ethereum, is that uh, you have this concept of the trusted computing base. Right, which is kind of like the we like we have to draw a line around a certain set of code and say that you know we we believe the output of this code to be deterministic and and, and trusted. Um, things like compilers end up inside the trusted computing base of uh, of your of your network if you're compiling Wasm contracts and those compilers are not super mature. They have bugs. Um, we're worried about things like compiler bombs, which can cause uh, compilation to slow down. And interpreting is much easier, much 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 safer. Uh, you guys are using interpreters right now, I think. Oh, you're not. Okay. Polkadot's using interpreters for sure. Okay. So there's also a sprite. So there's, I don't have time to go into all of this. There's different ways to compile. You can do what's called single pass compilation, which is uh, safer than optimizing compilation. Uh, yeah, compilers are very hard and very complex. Interpretation is much simpler. Um, and uh, Wasm as a VM has a relatively large attack surface compared to something like EVM or especially something like a Bitcoin script, right? Which is to say, you just can't do much with Bitcoin script. Bitcoiners love it. It's very safe for that reason. Um, you, you know, it's, it's Turing complete. And so you have to worry about um, all the challenges that go along with something that's Turing complete, reentrancy, you know, issues like that that have popped up in Ethereum previously. Uh, I'll skip this part. This is, talk, this is a brief introduction to um, the Space Mesh Virtual Machine because we have very limited time. And I'll just end here, which is some um, open design questions, uh, which I think are really interesting. And I think that this is one of the most interesting areas of research in blockchain for sure, but I'd say in computer science as well right now. Uh, it's, it's fascinating. Um, you know, uh, how do we efficiently do Like the, 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 the set of challenges looks a lot like challenges that people building operating systems like Linux were dealing with like 20, 30 years ago. Uh, and so I think it's very exciting. This, this is like, it makes, Blockchains like Ethereum, Space Mesh, Near, whatever, look and feel like the kind of operating systems of the future. How do we do basic stuff like memory management? What's the best way to do metering? There's many ways to do it. Uh, compilers, interpreters, we talked about that. Um, basic stuff, how do we reuse code? How do we have modules and link and embed modules and other modules? There's, again, many, many ways to do this. Um, interoperability across different platforms, right? Can I like write a piece of code and deploy it on Near and deploy it on Space Mesh and deploy it on Ethereum and 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 um, without with, with minimal tweaks or minimal modifications? Um, when we look at cross chain calls or cross shard calls, right? We need we immediately start getting into questions of async uh, asynchronous applications. How do we do that in Wasm? Um, that's challenging too. Uh, sweet. Thank you guys so much for listening. There's a really great article introducing the Space Mesh Virtual Machine by a gentleman named Yaron. It's his work, not my work. Um, Space Mesh has uh, some, yeah, a basic uh, SVM living on GitHub, and there's a there's a Gitter channel you can join, um, and you can find me and the project on Twitter as well. Whew. All right, thank you guys very much. <laughs>